Hey YouTube and welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge here on the internet. All right, um, we're turning to Extra History, one of my favorite uh, channels, um, history channels here on YouTube. And um, a topic I've been kind of interested just recently, just kind of my own, my own accord, um, is the Bronze Age Collapse, as it's called. Um, a lot of it because it's it's still quite mysterious um, with just this idea that you have these seemingly thriving um, civilizations. And then within a generation or so, they're gone. Um, and a lot of the mystery is around exactly who is responsible for this, because there's evidence of this these war, this warfare and invasion. And historians, uh, as far as I know, don't really have a consensus on who possibly this group was. Um, and then what arises from it, though, from the, the Bronze Age ashes here is, of course, the Iron Age and a bunch of other new civilizations. And I don't know, it's just something I've been kind of interested in lately and just kind of just on my leisurely time look, trying to look more into and, and, and see, you know, what, what pieces are there to put together. So when I saw that Extra, um, Extra History did a uh, mini series on it, I was excited and wanted to just jump right into it. So this is a multi-part series, and we're going to be checking out um, episode one today. So I'm hoping to learn a lot. If I can add something great, um, I'll try. But uh, let's uh, go ahead and try to learn together over here. All right, if you like the original video, please, please um, support them down below. They are supportive of um, me commenting, commenting on their videos very strongly, and I really appreciate that from um, the folks over there that make such great videos. So please, if you have not subbed to Extra History, please do that. And if you only, for some reason, have one sub to spare between subbing to me, subbing to them, go over there, okay? All right, but um, nevertheless, let's go ahead and get started. I'm excited to learn and see what, uh, what more I can learn about the Bronze Age Collapse. Giant cities, thriving civilizations, literacy, art, trade, wonders, temples, and palaces. Then nothing but cinder and ash. Crazy. Just gone. Like 50 years gone. The Bronze Age Collapse is one of history's greatest mysteries. All along the crescent, from modern-day Egypt to Greece, there once existed spectacular ancient civilizations. Civilizations that had lasted thousands of years, that built wonders like the Great Pyramids and the Palace Complex at Knossos. I love the um, Minoan civilization there at uh, Knossos, um, which is modern-day Crete. So yeah, you have like Egypt, you have Crete, um, and then the other groups in, uh, and then the, the, the Mesopotamian societies there who are thriving and doing these amazing things. It's, it's so neat and then just gone, but love Gnosis. Um, check out, uh, if you don't know about the Minoan society and maybe one of the most interesting and, and kind of more advanced of these very ancient societies that you may not know a, a lot about. Check them out. They were very, very advanced. The contemporaries with the ancient Egyptians and interacted with each other a lot, but um, they're really cool to learn about. Definitely do it. Then, after just a few decades, all of it was reduced to rubble. Between the years of 1200 and 1150 BCE, archaeologists found city after city burned, leveled to the ground. That, I mean, 50 years is such a short period of time, especially in the ancient world, um, short period of time where something like this could happen on the scale that I'm, they're, they're going to talk about here. That just the, it's, that's 50 years. That's, that's a generation. You could be alive before this collapse, and by the time you're old and dying, it's like a completely different world, right? That's just it's it's so amazing that the time, which is so short here. Um, yeah. Ce archaeologists found city after city burned, leveled to the ground. After thousands of years of thriving growth and prosperity, almost every major Bronze Age civilization collapsed in less than the span of a single human lifetime. And what followed was perhaps the darkest age in history. International trade disappears. Pottery becomes primitive, a throwback to an Writing. earlier age. Right. Construction of great monuments and temples ceases entirely. Centralized government vanishes. Certain skills and trades simply cease to be practiced. And perhaps most painful of all for us as students of history, the written word becomes yeah. almost extinct. That's what I want. I was hoping they would definitely do is writing and writing systems like died with it which is is crazy it's like they, they kind of like start over again luckily we we still had a lot to go off of um 
But think of how much was destroyed in that. Um, we would probably know a lot about well, more about, uh, a lot more about what happened to these people had a lot of this the knowledge of some of these writing systems had not gone away and probably been destroyed um, with the warfare with these these records probably you know um, being destroyed as well. In some areas, the ability to read and write appears to die out completely. In others, a few people desperately clung to the ancient art. Thank That's what makes this period such a mystery. People, right? Because of Thank the you. shrinking societies, the abandonment of cities and towns, the lack of royal decrees or record keeping, and the decline in buildings constructed out of permanent material like stone, no one really actually knows why Bronze Age civilization collapsed. So this series will be an overview of this mystery, a discussion of everything that we do know, and awesome. then some conjecture. Let's start by Sweet. setting the scene, and I'm for pumped. that, you must first I'm know pumped. the players. It's roughly 1200 BCE. A number of kingdoms, city-states, and proto-empires have sprung up in eastern North Africa, the Middle East, Anatolia, Greece, and the islands of the Aegean Sea. Starting from the south and working our way north, cool, cool. we first have Egypt. Egypt. Egypt New was Kingdom. the great power of the late Bronze Age world, with wealth and sophistication surpassing anything that the other empires could achieve. Egypt is already ancient. I mean, it's 1200 BC. They've been around for over 2,000 years, right? They're already ancient. Um, and this time you got the New Kingdom, which uh, expanded further than any kingdom, um, any of the previous, because you got the... the um, Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms, as they're called. And the New Kingdom um, expanded... Uh, uh, um, as far as anybody did, they got all the way up to basically the headwaters of Mesopotamia up into modern day Syria under Ramses. Um, so they were, you know, thriving in a lot of ways. So it's not like, like you, sometimes you see with the fall of civilizations, they often coincide with a time in that civilization's history where they're already in a big decline and just really not what they used to be. Um, but that's not necessarily the case for these groups, which again makes it more interesting. They're not just, you know, uh, uh, pushing over you know, a civilization that was already crumbling, right? They're, in some, some of these cases, thriving. This is not to say that the other empires were poor. There's quite a lot of evidence that, at least materially, people in this age were better off basically than every other era until the classical period. But Egypt was out there on top. Let's talk about their advantages. First off, the Nile. We may think of Egypt as a desert Nile. region today, but for most of ancient history, it was one of the most fertile places in the world. Now, no, um, Egypt, the Egyptian kind of empire kingdom, also did not go too far east or west from the Nile. Um, but it was useful. I mean, the Nile is, uh, especially in the ancient world, probably the best river there is. Its flooding is very predictable and a lot more gentle than, say, like the Tigris and Euphrates, which allowed Egypt to advance you know, early on so quick and, um, the natural protection that has always helped with, with Egypt, with, um, the Mediterranean up in the North, the Red Sea in the East, and you got deserts on both sides, um, has always been such a, a great place and been difficult for people to, um, take over, you know, it's going to be, you know, they're going to have their, their run-ins with invaders, but, um, Nile's an amazing ancient river, especially. Why? Because the Nile is an incredibly predictable river. It floods Sorry, regularly in a way that a society living off of irrigation can take enormous advantage of. And the flooding of the Nile didn't merely help irrigate the crops. It kept the soil rich and fertile, bringing in minerals and yep. nutrients Always that sustained it. agriculture would usually deplete in any other environment. So Egypt had an abundance of food in a time when most of humanity spent the majority of its days simply trying to produce enough food to survive. This allowed Egypt trade. to engage in long-distance commerce, create a strong military like with a Greeks. hereditary cast of warrior charioteers, and develop complex social and political mechanisms like a strong centralized bureaucracy and a highly developed religion. Yet, um, people often don't understand how important agriculture is to the development of every other part of society. If you have super productive agriculture, that then means you uh, can afford, I guess, to have part of your society specialize in other things. Where if you are a civilization where agriculture is extremely intensive and basically includes everybody all the time, you'll never have the time, right, or the people to go and develop other things like writing systems or how to become scribes or... Uh, specialize in architecture or anything like that. So agriculture is directly tied to intellectual developments. Not to mention build things like giant pyramids and sphinxes and sprawling temples. 
Egypt also benefited from the Nile as a highway. While the Nile cataracts forced merchants and travelers to switch boats or drag craft over land for a ways, the fact that almost all well, of most Egyptian of civilization existed along this river was a massive boon for communication, internal trade, even the movement of troops. Oh, and Egypt had one other thing. Gold. In the south, oh. the conquered Nubian kingdom of Kush was an unimaginable source of gold. No other Bronze Age kingdom had access to this quantity of gold wealth. Gold and artifacts from Egypt were Egypt's prized around the ancient well world. Off. With this wealth, the Egyptians had expanded well past its modern-day borders. Egypt controlled, yeah, either yeah. directly or indirectly, much of the territory along the Mediterranean coast from Sinai to Anatolia. Which, of course, put them into conflict with the Hittites. Hittites. By the time of our story, the, the Hittites workers, control most of Anatolia. Masters. They were a powerful militaristic society whose empire was built on the back of two economic advantages. Tin and copper, the elements of bronze. Mm -hmm. Copper they had in abundance from mines on the island of Cyprus, the only truly major source of copper throughout the Near East. It became a staple of Hittite trade. And then there's tin. Tin is actually shockingly rare here on Earth. It's not like iron or even copper. It's a lot closer to uranium in scarcity. Moreover, it's not evenly distributed, so oddly enough, there was almost no tin to be found where Bronze Age civilizations cropped up. They, it was kind of a mystery of um, where the Hittites got their tin. They try to keep it under wraps because they don't want, obviously, a whole bunch of people to know where they get it from. Um, so keep it kind of secret, right? And then you can be in charge of such a, a, an important technology like bronze working, right? So exclusivity, economic exclusivity is something very important. You know, maybe you, maybe you could like it into... Chinese silk and how protected they were of the secrets of how silk was actually made. You can kind of almost have a monopoly on it. Recent archaeological evidence shows that the Hittites had some production facilities for tin at Kestel in the Taurus Mountains, which, if true, may well have been the only tin production in the entire region. But this source, coupled with the Hittite ability to import both from the east through the Assyrians and from the west via trade routes coming through Europe, meant that they could help sustain hunger for tin throughout the Bronze Age world. This also put them in the crosshairs of basically everybody, and they had to fight continuously to keep their trade routes open. They were one of the few powers that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Egyptians, and, in fact, the oldest written peace treaty we have is from shortly before the collapse, in which these two superpowers agreed to stop trying to tear each other apart. <laughs> Why the ceasefire, though? Well, perhaps because they were both feeling pressure from another empire, oh, the Assyrians. Maybe because they were located brutal. further east. Syrians are a brutal, um, incredibly warlike culture. Um, to look into it more, it's not the point of this this video, but the Assyrian Empire were the most militaristic empires of the ancient world. I mean, their whole society was basically built on the idea that they have to constantly basically be conquering at all times. ...away from the coast, or perhaps due to some other combination of military prowess, political cohesion, and luck, the Assyrians would outlast these other empires for a hundred years before their own decline, meaning that they won't play too direct Good a job, role Assyrians. in our story. If anything, they serve as a foil, a counterbalance, an antagonizing force that'll keep the pressure on some of these other empires at a time where they can stand it the least. What the Assyrian Empire lacked was open trade ports on the Mediterranean coast, so they would be drawn to push westward, into the Hittite Empire and the Egyptian tributary states of the Levant, whenever they think these empires are too weak to resist them. Which leaves us with just one other people, the Mycenaeans. These were the Proto-Greeks. They ruled from most of southern Greece to the island of Crete. Oh, not they were about seafarers, no instrumental in the vast trading network that extended throughout the Bronze Age world. They were also the industrial center for much of the ancient world, importing raw goods and then exporting finished products, built through a complex top-down system of industry. They were renowned for their Cyclopean fortifications and palaces which served as manufacturing centers, political hubs, and school. redoubts. They were masters of complex engineering yeah, and built- Tomb there, that thing's so cool. Um, you look inside, it's got a, a dome inside of it. So Mycenaean culture is very cool. Um, kind of the pre-Greeks, as you would kind of call them there, who come in and Minoan civilization, they overlap. Uh, Mycenaeans basically are going to overtake them eventually when the Minoan society collapses. Um, but yeah, actually, interesting about Mycenaean um, culture, a lot of the Greek mythology that's famous, the, the religion and um, 
stories from the Iliad and Odyssey are Mycenaean um, and then were passed down, which is probably passed down through the centuries, uh, which is probably why all the Greek city states shared so many religious ideas from their gods and also same uh, heroic stories. It comes from a similar source that predates them. Builders of great roads. They were also spectacular artists. Even the Egyptian. I love that one. No, it's one of the coolest. Oh, and on. builders of great roads. They were also spectacular. It's got like the mask of Agamemnon, the famous Mycenaean king from uh, the ancient stories with um, uh, Achilles, right? He's the king of kind of uniter of the Greece, the Greeks, as they are supposed to have uh, destroyed Troy. So that's one of the coolest artifacts out there. Um, this funeral kind of mask. I forget exactly what they call it, the something mask of Agamemnon. Very cool. Oh no. I rewinded it. Let's find where we were. Sorry. Talk talk amongst yourselves as I get the as I get it back. Tin. Hittites. I think we're actually almost done. We'll, we'll go back right here. Sorry about that. Doubts. They were masters of complex engineering and builders of great roads. They were also spectacular artists. Even the Egyptians would sometimes hire or emulate them. Sure. But they, like all the rest, would fall. Join us next Rip. time as we discuss the technology, social structure, and politics that make these societies possible, but might also set them up for collapse. Probably will, right? Well, cool. Setting up the players here. Um... And yeah, all these civilizations are going to fall within about a 50-year time span. Although I said the Assyrians lasted another 100 years after that. But um, yeah, the, the, the point, you know, big point was that these civilizations were doing quite well, right? Like, I, like I've said a couple times now, they weren't just like already ready to be pushed over. They're already leaning, you know. So that makes it even more mysterious that um, this could happen so quickly. You know what I mean? All right, well, let's go ahead and we're going to go ahead and watch uh, number two. Try the new Nashville hot brisket at Firehouse okay. Subs. On a brisket sandwich. All right. Verbal, oh, verbal. I must get away. A beach house. A cabin. A great place to stay. Oh, gosh, let's the wheel turn. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and watch um, episode two. So this one's called The Wheel and the Rod. So let's check this one out. Turns. Ages pass, society becomes more advanced. Advancement leads to stability, to connection, to peace. But what happens when that's not true? Okay. We got an exception to history. Always Often important. when we think of the ancient Ooh, past, Easter the times before the Greeks and the Romans, we think of a barbaric or a primitive age. But that age of barbarism we think of actually followed the late Bronze Age collapse. <laughs> Before the collapse, backwards. there were societies that wouldn't be rivaled again for half a millennium. So today, let's look at the technology, social policies, and political structures that made these kingdoms so impressive, so advanced, cool. and that may, in the end, have led to their downfall. Let's do First, it. we have to talk about bronze itself. As we touched on last time, bronze is an alloy of tin and copper, and most of the Bronze Age world was missing at least one of those components. This meant that Bronze Age civilizations had to trade. And I'm not just talking about small-time exchanging of shinies. We're talking a full-on, modern-day, our-society-requires-trade-to-function type of trade. Everything from farming to war depended on bronze, much in the same way it depends on petroleum today. So a globalized, like internationalized system of trade sprung up around bronze, and with it came trade in almost every other good. This was a positive thing. It allowed a material standard of wealth, especially for the nobility, that was unrivaled anywhere in the world, except maybe for China. Yeah, they, each of these civilizations has something to offer. Like you saw with, with um, Egypt, they have a big abundance of um, food, agriculture, the most, productive agri the most productive agricultural society in this whole region of the world. Um, so they can, you know, easily trade with places that maybe don't have great agriculture, like in Mycenae, in modern era, in, in, in Greece there. Um, they don't have the agricultural productivity like Egypt does, but they have like, you know, mining materials and stuff like that that they can trade. So they all depended on each other, right? That was so important. Again, you got stuff, I got stuff, let's trade. 
and hopefully not fight as much, but of course they all fought each other all the time. This level of wealth wouldn't be seen again until the Classical Age, but it also meant that the kingdoms of the period were sort of like a Jenga tower. They stood tall, but if too many pieces got pulled out, that whole thing would come crashing down. So this interconnected okay. system of trade, while enormously beneficial, may perhaps have also been one of the factors leading to the Bronze Age collapse. Next, let's talk war, because in this period, the chariot was king. Almost all the major powers of the time built their armies around a chariot corps of one type or another. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing about chariots. They're really expensive and they're difficult to use. You can sort of think of them like medieval knights. It takes a lifetime of training to use these weapons, and maintaining them costs a small fortune. This meant that, like medieval knights, many kingdoms had a hereditary warrior class that was dedicated to doing just this. And remember, you can only have a full-time military like this if you have a productive agricultural society. If you don't have that, then you can't spare people um, to be able to do that. So usually these these warriors, full-time warriors, come from a noble class, landowners, right? That then use peasants, whatever, just regular workers... And they take care of the fields, they take care of the day-to-day -day, day operations, thus allowing a usually noble class to devote themselves to full-time military warfare. So again, it's, it's it's becoming more interesting that in these productive societies that have these large standing armors, armies, they're still going to fall at roughly the same time. That's amazing. But what happens if you lose a ton of those guys at once? You can't just replace them. It takes years to train a guy up to the point where he can be proficient with a chariot. And what happens if your economy collapses? You no longer have the spare resources to maintain a caste whose singular role is to train to use some what's complex weapon, here? much less to pay artisans Before. to build that weapon and technicians to maintain it. And so, while this particular engine of war was highly effective in a time when we hadn't really bred horses big enough to carry a man in full armor, it was also <laughs> a liability. If things went really wrong, you could no longer maintain this highly sophisticated military so gonna machine. Break down the economy. And then what happens if you need to defend yourself? What happens if you face some outside threat? What happens if you have to fight, but your whole conception of what an army is is no longer viable? And okay. so, again, this very weapon that made many of these states so dominant is perhaps one of the dominoes that sets us up for the Bronze Age collapse. And since we're talking about armies, we'll let's talk about yeah. the governments they fought for, because these were incredibly organized, incredibly centralized governments. The level of central control in the late Bronze Age states is almost mind-boggling, far, far beyond the monarchies of the Middle Ages, perhaps even more than many oh, yeah. modern states, it's which is important because due to this centralized control, many of the late Bronze Age kingdoms were structured as command economies. Every piece of grain, every mm -hmm. dram of olive oil, government every bar it. of bronze was tallied by the central government. Farmers were told what to plant, where to plant, and when. Mines were state-run operations, and clearly this varies a bit from nation to nation, but from Egypt to Mycenae, you had top-down economies. Yeah, the, the command economies we see all throughout history, but it takes a very specific type of society to even be able to have this. You have to have this much wealth and production um, with that sort of thing. They keep comparing it to the Middle Ages, where you did not have central authorities. After Rome fell, um, like in Europe, for example, there was no central authorities, um, which developed feudalism, which is far more localized, right? Localized um, um, nobles that can, that can do that, not a central, far-reaching government here. Yeah, you, again, you have to be productive. You can't. You have to be an incredibly productive society to be able to have a command, uh, a command economy. Organized by the central authority. But what happens to a top-down economy when the top goes missing? If you're a laborer, and every year an Fractions. official comes and gives you the seeds you're supposed to plant, and tells you when and where to plant them, what happens if that official just stops showing up? Localization. And this issue is compounded yeah. by two other pieces of technology. The first is irrigation. Bronze Age societies had very sophisticated irrigation systems. Sure. These were massive public works projects that took effort to maintain, and it took, took some element of centralized planning to build them efficiently to Had maximize to. crop yield. After all, having every farmer dig their own irrigation is going to get way messier than simply laying out a thousand plots at once. Standardized. This was great, as it meant high crop yields, which in turn meant that you could support big cities filled with artisans, priests, warrior nobles, and bureaucrats. 
and being able to support so many specialized positions in turn means more material wealth, a stronger government, and more opportunity for innovation. But what happens when that irrigation system gets destroyed, or simply stops functioning as efficiently? Well, then you've got a whole mess of people in your society who don't make food. And even ignoring the potential problems that Restructure arise from the society. fact that some of these people are very well armed, what happens when you can't support the non-food producers, but they're the planners who make this system run? The problem just compounds until you have a runaway collapse. And that's not the only problem caused by using advanced irrigation to support an ever-growing population. First, there's the obvious issue of overpopulation. Even if your food supply can support a large number of people, can the rest of your infrastructure? There are health and sewage concerns. There's a question as to whether your economy can really employ all of these people. And, of course, there's the question of whether you can keep these people from revolting. But there's also a less obvious problem with this type of intense agriculture, and that is soil degradation. Whenever you heavily farm an area, you leach out minerals, you right. create erosion, and rotate. you disturb the soil biology. Today, we do a great deal with modern farming techniques to avoid this, but the Late Bronze Age was perhaps the first time that humans had farmed on this scale. And, as we mentioned last time, while the Nile did bring with it rich silt that helped to restore the soil whenever it flooded, this just wasn't true of many of the other kingdoms. They, the, the, yeah, these, um, this understanding of depletion of nutrients in soil, the ancient world, wasn't necessarily aware of. But the thing is, too, about the, the um, depletion of these soil nutrients also takes a long time. It takes multi it takes many generations for that to happen. Almost in imperceptibly it happens, right? Like the Roman Empire had the same issue where they had uh, incredible agricultural production, um, but were over-cultivating. And it's in the Middle Ages, afterwards, they figure out the importance of um, uh, like crop rotation. Right, that you don't farm all of your land, and you rotate plots of land, and you rotate the types of crops that are on each type of land, um, because that ends up preserving more of the nutrients. Um, what's going to happen there? But again, that that soil deg degradation is a very slow process. And so, silently, year after year, perhaps too slowly for anyone to really notice, crop yields decreased, and with them, the ability to support the ever-growing population of the late Bronze Age states. And lastly, we have to talk about writing, because the Bronze Age world had come to rely on writing for everything Actually, from highly advanced record keeping to international diplomacy. You can't have a, a, a large centralized government without a writing system, because especially if you're actually doing a command economy where the government is making so many decisions and decrees about economic production, you have to have a writing system. Um, so I could totally see that if, if it, how a writing system could get forgotten or lost because it's based on necessity. If your writing isn't necessary in certain scenarios, um, if you don't have a centralized government um, or not doing as much of long distance trade and that sort of thing, you don't actually have that much of a need for the record keeping. So those are directly tied to each other. Amazing how everything is tied to agriculture, isn't it? Right, writing and, and social structures and militaries, it's all tied to that. But a scribe is sort of like a knight of letters. They're amazingly powerful, but they're also expensive, and they require training from a young age. And though history shows that having the written word propels civilizations forward, and that every small increase in literacy ends up rippling out into large increases in the well-being of a society over time, even this idea that we usually think of as a purely positive beneficial technology creates a potential liability. After all, if your whole liability, society so. depends on written records and on record keeping, what do you do when there's no one left to write the records? True. And so, piece by piece, the very complexity, the very advancedness that made late Bronze Age societies so impressive, so much better to live in than anything that followed for hundreds of years, also made them more fragile. As societies became complex, interweaving chains of trade, agriculture, education, and bureaucracy, the potential damage that could be caused by removing any link from those chains grew and grew. So join us next time as we look at what might have caused those chains to snap. Okay, so they've set up... Yeah, so they're still not to the causes of the um, Bronze Age Collapse. But what they've definitely set up here now is, I guess, how 
fragile this could be. Okay, um, that there are so many interconnected parts to these to these civilizations that if you move a link in the chain, right, then it ruins the whole thing. So we definitely can see, you know, if one of these things falls in within that society and the way they're structured and how they operate, it could, yeah, definitely bring the whole thing down or at least completely reorganize it which is which is definitely what happens but i'm definitely looking forward to seeing more of potential theories about what had happened right so they're not saying these things are why it collapsed they're just saying that they are um smaller again smaller pieces uh, pieces to a larger puzzle and you will not have a complete puzzle um and your whole yeah structure can collapse with one jenga pulling out of the, the Jenga block. So I like that analogy there. Okay, well, cool. Um, we've definitely set the stage now. I think we are, we learned a lot of really good background history as to why these civilizations were successful and what made them successful. Um, I thought they did a great job of that. I mean, they, yeah, before, before you know, um, I was all comment, commenting on stuff that they eventually commented on too. So I'm glad we're definitely on the same page with a lot of those things um, that they were important. They got to most of the things I was thinking of, um, for, for why they'd be important. So awesome, awesome start so far. I'm really, really enjoying this. So yeah, we'll, um, get into part three, um, with the next video. So we just watched the first two parts. Hopefully you enjoyed it and hopefully you keep an eye out for, um, the rest of the series and I'll get to those, um, as soon as I can, cause I definitely want to, um, learn more about this. So, all right, before we head out though, make sure you, um, head over to or head down to the description where you see a link to their um um their channel the extra history people do a great job so be sure to go over there like and subscribe to the videos looks like they got a patreon account too to support them that'd be fantastic um if you'd like to join patreon for my channel that'd be awesome too um one of the perks that you get for joining patreon is to vote on videos um that i check out. Um, so that's a way you can interact and have a little more influence on what's get, what gets on this channel. Um, if you would like to do that, that's awesome too. If you'd like to be part of our community as well, um, there was a link down below to our discord server, which has a whole bunch of, uh, history minded people that are up for a conversation basically with any, um, historical, uh, topic. So it's a great place to spend some time. All right. With that, um, hope to see you soon. Um, and we'll go ahead and call it here and we'll see you next time. Bye.